Hi, Philip. How are you? Kia ora. Hello. I'm good, thank you. Kia ora. How are you? Yeah, very good, very good. And we're spanning many, many time zones here from the London morning to the outer air late evening. So I'm keeping you up a bit late, but thank you for making the time to talk to me. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Um, so we have a few uh, sort of secondhand connections. So um, I listened to your fascinating talk with um, facilitated by Pablo Castello recently, and he suggested that I reach out to you and see if you wanted to come on as a guest. Um, so it's been great to explore your writing in The Guardian and elsewhere. Um, and you've co-written a piece with Kim Stallwood, another previous guest of mine too. So we have a few sort of secondhand connections. So it's great to have the chance to have a proper conversation. Um, and um, as we've discussed briefly before, it's a series of conversations that, about what I see as of as the two deepest philosophical questions, what's real and what and who matters. Um, and I'm framing these conversations with an obvious bias because I'm trying to popularize and develop this very simple worldview called sentientism, which suggests that when thinking about what's real and what to believe, we take a naturalistic approach using evidence and reason. And when it comes to who matters, we use a sentiocentric scope, if you like, that we at least include all sentient beings, any being that can experience suffering and flourishing in our moral consideration. But I'm lucky in these conversations to talk to a dazzling variety of different people who some of whom agree and some of whom disagree with aspects or all of that philosophy. So it'll be great to explore your philosophical journey and see where you've got to now. But before we get onto those mind bendingly big questions, how would you best introduce yourself and your work to people who don't know you? Uh, well, that's a, that's a big question too. Uh, my name is Philip. I am a writer from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, on my mother's side, I whakapapa or relate to Kaitahu, which is the largest uh, iwi or tribe of the South Island of New Zealand. But I also obviously have European ancestry. And those two strands of ancestry and cultural heritage uh, really shape my thinking. As I say, I'm a writer, so I, I frequently write articles. Uh, I also write fiction, but most of the time I seem to be writing articles mainly about animal issues and Maori issues, but I have a much broader range of interests. And I am especially uh, at work in developing the politics of love, which is a vision of politics that I'm sure we'll get on to discussing in more detail at some point. Uh, but I, a few years ago, I, I published a book, which is a collection of articles and essays on the politics of love. And I'm actively engaged in extending this vision. Yeah, sounds great. And that will resonate richly through the rest of the conversation. I'm sure it's been fascinating to dig into. So thank you for that introduction. So let's go to the first of these big questions, what's real or what to believe. So for many of my guests, that's a story about whether they grew up in maybe a more naturalistic, sometimes atheistic or agnostic, scientifically minded context and culture and family, or one that was more supernaturally influenced, more mystical, more spiritual somehow, and how that side of their thinking has changed through the course of their life, if it has. So it would be fascinating. You can wind the clock back as far as you like, but it'd be interesting to know your philosophical journey so far on epistemology. Hmm. So when I was growing up, I don't think either of my parents were very religious, uh, but I did have a religious influence in my life through my secondary school. So I went to an Anglican uh, high school called King's College, and, and while I was there, we had chapel services uh, quite frequently, and, and those made quite a strong impression on me, uh, even though I had grown up in what I guess could be best described as agnostic, yeah. <laughs> an yeah. agnostic household. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I was quite taken with the sermons um, delivered by one of our chaplains in particular, uh, Reverend Murray Bean. Uh, and I was taken by those sermons because uh, he spoke more about love and, and the best ways of relating to each other than he did about uh, God, or at least that was my perception at the time. And so yeah, I did. Ha I did have that influence, and that has underpinned and and continued to inform my thinking around morality and ethics, uh, and especially love. Yeah, no, that's that's fascinating. Thank you. And you've already indicated one of the core difficulties in these conversations because I try and artificially structure that epistemology up here and then the ethics later on. But I think they very naturally and very powerfully link and. 
you've illustrated that beautifully already. So, um, but if I force you to stick on the epistemology, as you were listening to those sermons, it sounds like it was the ethics and the compassion and the love that really pulled you in and drew you through. But did that come with some of the epistemology as well? Would you describe yourself as an Anglican now? Do you believe in a a Christian God? Do you um, think of, you know, heaven and hell and, you know, some of the other stuff that comes with that or? Yeah, no, very very little. (laughs) I, yeah. I, and I don't describe myself as an Anglican or a Christian. I yeah. was confirmed at the age of 14, which I think is ridiculous, really, that I was allowed to, I was allowed to go through with that because yeah. what, the, what do 14-year-olds know? So, so I ended up becoming very interested in political philosophy eventually, which I guess mm. is where I sort of am now. Uh, and it's interesting for me to think about the, the journey that, that it took me to get there. So, you know, when I was at high school, listening to these sermons, uh, I think I was struck by that ethical dimension of what was being said to me. And, and I think a lot of a lot of the epistemological and, and metaphysical uh, background was sort of smuggled in with that. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, eventually I started becoming more curious about these questions, metaphysical questions. Uh, you know, what is the nature of the universe? Is there a God? Uh, where does morality come from? Yeah. Uh, which I don't, th- I don't think about all that often these days. But, you know, back then, those were the questions. And, and initially I started, you know, with Anglicanism, I guess, and then thinking about other religions, comparative religion, and that eventually led me to philosophy. And when I got to philosophy, uh, when I got to university and, and started studying philosophy alongside English, I was, I was still very much concerned with those metaphysical questions. Uh, but over time, I really made a turn in my thinking towards uh, the normative, towards ethical and political uh, philosophical questions. And I think, you know, looking back, the reason for that is that I did some reading that just convinced me that ultimately the final nature of reality is unknowable to us and we just have to proceed on, you know, on our senses. So the, the big thinker for me there was, was Albert Camus, who, who, you know, basically spends a long time thinking about uh, whether or not uh, life has some transcendental meaning. And he basically says, I don't know. <laughs> he basically concludes <laughs> by saying, I don't know if, if, this, if this world um, has an ultimate, ultimate meaning that justifies life and that gives our lives purpose. But what I do know is that ultimately that meaning is unknowable to me right now. And so... You know, we basically need to do our best with what we've got. And that was quite compelling to me as a line of reasoning. And so, uh, you know, uh, that set me, I think, on a different on a different path toward uh, or maybe brought me back towards thinking about, you know, these ethical questions uh, in terms of love and in terms of relationship. Yeah, and then that was that was the focus. So it feels like the it was the ethics and the and that side of thinking that was com- interesting to you in the Anglican stories you were hearing. As you continued on your life, you've turned even more to focus on those things. You know, the questions of politics and ethics and compassion and love as being more centrally important than maybe the epistemology. Um, you've hinted that in those spheres, you are willing to have this sort of humility and sense of uncertainty about whether we'll ever, you know, reach dazzlingly perfect answers. It's just like we're working things through and doing what we can. It, it, does that apply in the epistemology front as well? And in, in that there's also a sense of, you know, there's things we may never be able to know. You know, we may be wrong, but the best we can do is use our senses and evidence and reason to work things out in the meantime. Is there, is there a parallel on both sides? Yes, I think so. I'm yeah. not sure that I necessarily think about it in those terms, but yes, I think we do just need to, we do need to accept that we're not going to, well, well, I think we can spend, I guess the way that I do think, the term, terms in which I do think about this is we can spend a lot of time, uh, you know, in musty offices thinking about uh, these esoteric philosophical questions and, mm. you know, the world, <laughs> the world will burn, you know, and, you know, we can be distracted by those. I think we need to be engaged in work that tries to bring about a better world in light of what is quite obvious suffering and quite obvious wrongdoing. 
Yeah. Uh, and that might sound naive philosophically, but you know, it seems to me that those are the, those are the two alternatives, right? You have the the uh, thinking about thinking about problems and, and and essentially denying the importance of actually getting involved in the here and now, uh, or you can get involved in the here and now and you know accept that you know take a humble approach uh, and and accept that you know we have to go on what we can <laughs> what yeah. we can feel and what we can sense. Yeah. Makes sense, makes sense. So I will let you um, move off the epistemology stuff in a moment, but I guess where you are now on purely on epistemology, would you describe that as broadly naturalistic, that you use evidence and reason to work out what to believe? Or are there certain elements of, you know, the supernatural or the transcendent or the magical that are still, you know, in themselves, you think they're true? Mm, so, yes, I think I think I do believe that there is something transcendent that is true yeah uh, and and i describe this you know in very broad terms as as something spiritual and i relate it to love but i am very careful when i when i think about this and when i articulate this which is not very often because you know i don't often get asked about asked yeah. about this but yeah. i i think where we are communing with the spiritual and taking inspiration from the spiritual we need to ask that <laughs> that which we're receiving through a uh, critical filter uh, through yeah we need to think critically and we need to find uh, reasons that support uh, our accepting that inspiration and that understanding um, so it might be helpful if I if I talk about uh, some examples like uh, there are a number of uh, figures who I would describe as prophets of love and who mm. I've written about as prophets of love. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. is one example, and Te Whiti o who is a uh, Māori prophet uh, who lived in the 19th century, uh, you know, is another, and, and he practiced passive resistance. Uh, at a place called Parihaka, which is in the North Island of New Zealand. You know, I, I believe that these two figures were communing, I use deliberately vague language because I don't think it can be pinned down, but communing with the spiritual. They were receiving some sort of spiritual inspiration yeah. that inspired them and gave shape and content to their thinking. Uh, but I don't think they were uncritical in their reception of that spiritual content. And I think uh, likewise that, well, I don't know if all of us, but I, you know, I'd like to think that all of us have that, have that capacity to commune with the spiritual. But I think that when we do, we need to be uh, very careful with that. And as I say, find reasons to support uh, the directions in which it would lead us. Yeah. Thank you. It's a fascinating way of putting it. And it, I get the sense that when you're talking about this transcendent sense of the spiritual, that doesn't f sound like it's a personality or a being or a, a God in a traditional sense. It's, is it more, it's more amorphous than that. Um, I don't want to sort of press you into, you know, no, 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 this is, this is interesting. If I, if I, sound reluctant it's because i don't often talk about this uh yeah. and there are reasons why i don't often talk about this because it, because it's not something that i dwell on too much firstly and also yeah. because i think it, it, it can give the wrong impression about about my thinking about what i hold to be important but yeah when i think about when i think about the spiritualness that is being communed with mm. i think yeah, I so as I briefly mentioned, I understand it in terms of love, but I think it is that which has been understood uh, in a whole lot of different ways uh, that have been shaped by the various cultural trad traditions that uh, people have found themselves within. So this very thing that I described in terms of love, I think other people have described in terms of God, uh, for example, or in terms of purpose or meaning or mm. you know spirituality generally, and. One of the reasons why I say I use very I use deliberately vague terms to talk about is because I I think that our attempts to name it, even you know, this very uh, vague encompassing word that I give it, love, I think, you know, in naming it, we force 
or project our own interpretations onto it that uh, that in themselves prevent us from fully understanding and, and, and understanding it and engaging with it on its own terms. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's especially, you know, especially the case when we uh, use more specific terms and more specific context, uh, concepts like the notion of God and more specifically the Christian God. You know, I think that just takes us further away from what it actually is, even though that might be, you know, that recognition that's taking place. Yeah. <laughs> if that makes any sense. No, thank you. Thank you. And I think I'm fascinated by the link between these sorts of epistemologies and ethics, obviously, because I think they do flow through and it strikes me intuitively through many of these conversations that th there seems to be more of a risk of a warping of compassionate ethics through a formalized institutional religion with a god in some sense because it te often leads to there being a rich vein of compassion but that compassion is often made conditional on you following certain rules or it's made partial and constrained to a certain in-group maybe sometimes the compassion is not there for its own sake or for the sake of the others it's there because ultimately the god is telling you to be compassionate that's the real reason it's actually ultimately more about obedience than it is compassion so so maybe those institutional religions with a with a formalized god sometimes seem to have more of a risk of warping a you know a universal compassion than maybe a, a broader sense of spirituality and and love because I don't think you have the specificity of the rules or the being or the cultural structures that can then have that influence. So I, I get this sense that maybe a, a broader sense of spirituality maybe has less risk of warping or constraining compassionate ethics, but I'm not sure how strongly that holds. But I was really interested in the other thing you talked about that this isn't something that is just unquestionably accepted and implemented it's something that you have to take a critic, critical you know some sort of rational reasoned a, approach to and to me that seems like another safeguard as well because you know there are other people who will talk about spirituality and will have such a degree of confidence in what their interpretation of that spirituality is it can lead them to do some pretty terrible things and lead them to some awful ethics so i'm always interested about how we can, you know, about how those things link, I guess. So I, I don't know how you, how you think about the nature of spiritual belief and the risks that sometimes come with that and some interpretations of it and how uh, we can avoid those dangers. Mm. Does that make sense? That was of... Yes, yes it, does. yes, it does. And that's a very, very big question. I don't, don't pretend to have all, uh, yeah. all or any of the answers in relation to this, but... You know, for myself, I, I think I recognize and I share that concern uh, and that that sense of danger that that comes with uh, thinking that justifies itself only in terms of the religious or the spiritual. And I um, partly because almost by definition, it's unchallengeable by others. Yeah, and and also potentially. Uh, unknowable in the same yeah. terms and i think when it comes you know a lot of my thinking is around is around political action and ethical action as well and you know i think when we start to think about ethics and politics we're necessarily starting to think about community and relationship and if we're going to be deriving ethical uh, guidance from somewhere we need to be able to communicate and uh, share the reasons for that and yeah i think uh, with some religious thinking and some spiritual thinking there is a a tendency to say that we don't actually we don't actually need to uh, even have reasons let alone share them they just just needs to be accepted yeah um, but yeah going back to what you were what you were saying before about you know a uh, 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 broader spiritual commitment uh, or a uh, spiritual outlook being more uh, more fluid and more more practical you know there is a, a sort of thought that I've had <laughs> at several at several points uh, in my intellectual journey around how I might 
try and frame some of my thinking around spirituality and ethics and uh, relation to the Christian cr- Christian tradition. You know, you, you have the the Old Testament where morality is sort of handed down in rules, and then you in the New Testament you have. Uh, Jesus and others coming and saying, well, actually, you know, it's a little bit more slippery than this. It's not, it's not quite so black and white. And then, you know, if you were to take that, take that forward to a third step, you know, I've often thought about this as a writing exercise. Uh, you know, what would the next, what would the next step be? Even though, I, even though I'm not, ne- not necessarily wanting to um, build on or, or justify that tradition, but the next step might be, uh, well, actually. You know, it is something much broader, like love, or you know, other people will have other words for it. But so you know, there's a third, there's a third know, testament coming. <laughs> well, maybe uh, not from me, but yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But you know, that that broader stepping back and and getting to uh, maybe a uh, a more mature philosophical and ethical outlook, one that doesn't rely on rules or, and doesn't and doesn't even rely on, you know, being taught by uh, uh, religious teachers as such, but rather requires us to embrace uh, and embody love and work it out for ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> and recognising uh, that there is all of this uncertainty, uh, recognising that uh, there aren't always clear answers uh, and that we do need to uh, ultimately Try, uh, strive for uh, responsibility uh, with all of the heaviness that that entails. Yeah, thank you. And I think I like the way you put that almost ev- evolution to focus more on the fundamentals in a broader sense. And you know, it's much less about specific rules or specific practices or you must do this, or you must do not do that. It's it's almost going back to the basics. And in a way, I think I mean we'll talk about this next, but it has much in common with I guess where I think I've feel like I've ended up even with a hundred percent boring sort of naturalistic worldview where, you know, I don't think of, I don't really use terms of like spirituality or soul or transcendence or the mystical or anything supernatural at all. But at the same time, and in a, in a sense, the, the love or the compassion that I think are centrally important and universally so pragmatically and descriptively spring from just biological evolution. You know, it's from the compassion that, uh, mother feels for its child and, and vice versa, even pre-human. And in a sense, what we're, what I think we should do now is not because there's an external imperative or because even there's a, you know, logical self-interested reason. I just think at the very simplest sense, we should take the choice to express that universal compassion a- across species boundaries and all the intra-human boundaries we have too. Um, now, so in a sense, that feels like we're almost coming quite close together. But I would still suggest that me framing that in a purely naturalistic sense is still missing something for you. You know, even if my universal compassion across species and across all of humanity is totally naturalistically grounded, that you would still think oh, that there's something else missing. There's something about this external spirituality or something transcendent that's missing from that worldview, Jamie. Would you? <laughs> no, no, not necessarily. And yeah, it's interesting. It's, inter- it's, it's interesting that you that you asked that and, that and that you think that that could be the case. And I can see why you might think that that would be the case. But I would say that actually, this what I how I believe we should uh, understand um, ethics and morality is actually entirely consistent with what you, what you would describe as naturalistic view, and that it should operate. Uh, you know, we should be able to find reasons uh, for and can find reasons for acting in a loving way, uh, independent, independently of uh, this, uh, this spirituality that I've described. So much so that, you know, I would, I would also say it's, you know, it doesn't play a, a huge part in my thinking, just thinking about <laughs> spir- spirituality. Yeah. And, and, you know, if, if we hadn't started with such, uh, such deep questions, I might not have, <laughs> might not have even mentioned it. Uh, so, yeah. No, that's fascinating. It's, it feels like it's 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 important to you, but it's not it's not a centrally necessary element of the way you of of, of your worldview because you also want to bring criticality and reasoning and you know these other aspects to bear. So it's it's important, but it, it's not definitionally central, and it doesn't drive it. So if that spirituality changed its nature or faded away in your mind, 
doesn't feel like that would send an earthquake through your ethics. You'd have to start from scratch. It feels like you're, you've, you've got a broader grounding than that. And it's an aspect of that rather than being, you know, the essence of it. Yeah. 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 And rather than being, yeah, fundamental to it or critical to it, I guess I, I wouldn't necessarily frame in terms of, you know, having the potential to fade away, but rather if, you know, I suddenly lost the ability to have that communion, communion or if somebody else didn't have or didn't choose to have that communion. But, you know, something that I do think about is, you know, in relation, in relation to these questions is the notion of coherence. I think without, without this ultimate meaning that we can, that we can point to and that can underpin uh, our morality uh, in any definite way, we need to find some some firm ground on which to build our ethics, and uh, yeah, I think reason can give strength, can strengthen, or uh, sustain, or give an infrastructure to our ethics without necessarily giving us an ultimate uh, resting place for it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you want me to say more about that or not, or maybe maybe it'll come well, up later. But yeah, I mean, let's 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 let's. I'm going to let you off on the epistemology now because I, that, I found that absolutely fascinating. But you know, as you've indicated, in a way, what really matters is the ethics, the implications, the politics. Now, with the, we engage with the world as a, as a result of that. So it's been interesting to explore, and I do think there is a degree of coherence and, and you know, a, a certainly strong overlap between the way. You know your journey, and I think where I feel I've got to as well, and some of that stuff, um, despite in a sense, you know, them seeming like very different worldviews. One being more about spirituality, and one being very hard edged naturalistic. I think it's encouraging that we can find some coherence in terms of thinking about ethics. But let's explore that now. Um, and um, you've already made it clear that ideas of love are central to how you think about what matters um and you've also written uh, uh, um, some great work including a piece by that you did with kim stallward about this balance of you know the intellectual bases for ethics and thinking about what matters and then maybe the emotional or the, the sense of senses of compassion and love and how those play into each other as well so very broadly um how would you say you answer the question about you know what are good and bad, what are right and wrong. What what's the foundation of ethics if there really is one for you? Mm. So, yeah, as you pointed out, I I understand uh, ethics in relation to love and relationship, and yeah, I don't. Yeah, I guess I don't necessarily think of it in these terms. In terms of what it, what is the foundation of our ethics? I I, yeah. I think we. Uh, I. So ultimately, I think that we need to uh, affirm the morality that we want uh, to be in the world. Uh, we need to construct that uh, morality, and we need to affirm it. And. Uh, that is essentially the the project with the politics of love. I'm not uh, trying to appeal to uh, anything really in particular, uh, either spiritual or naturalistic, in in and seeking a foundation. I simply want. I simply start, I guess, with the the insight that we are living in a in an absurd absurd world, and I get that uh, word from Camus, but it's also informed yeah. by Nietzsche. You know, this absurd world where we uh, essentially do not know if there is uh, transcendent meaning and don't have access to it if there is, and we need to uh, determine and assert and affirm our own values. And so I believe that, and or, or affirm or assert that we should uh, try to act lovingly and try to be loving. And uh, the politics of love, which is as much an ethical, <laughs> uh, an ethical vision as it is a political vision, uh, attempts to elaborate uh, what love looks like beyond well i guess for all of our for all of our politics so all of our social interactions uh, big and small yeah and i and i and i like that way of putting it because 
there is a, there's a there's a desperation sometimes to ground ethics you know to answer that question of okay but why but why should i care so some will will use a supernatural rationale for that they say well because god says and that's supposed to be the end of the argument although of course you can still say why should we obey god and why should we do what god says so i'm not sure that particular answer helps there are other people who will say look even independent of a supernatural rationale there are um, you know, objective ethical truths that if we do enough good philosophy and we do enough thinking, and we sit in our ivory tower, you know, we can come to some sort of logical structure that proves here is the grounding of ethics. Um, and one, I don't think we'll find that. Um, and two, even if we did, you could still say, okay, but why should I, why, why should I follow these truths? You could say, I, I found the ethical truths and people will still say, but why should I follow them? So I don't think that helps either. Um, you can also follow a purely descriptive path where you can say, well, uh, we evolved to have the ability to cooperate and you know, compassion and love are part of how we negotiate those relations. And um, you know, that's how we've come to have compassion. Um, and I think that's interesting descriptively, but that's not a normative ethic. And to be honest, if you base a normative ethic on a description of evolution, you're going to end up in some awful places too. So I, you know, I'm not sure that's a productive path to go down as well. And that, you know, the best possible outcomes there are some form of you know, reciprocation based ethic, which essentially ignore people and beings that you don't have the capacity to form relationships with, which seems pretty harsh too. So, you know, I, so I, I find that exercise of, you know, trying to, completely perfectly ground ethics a little frustrating because I think in that desperation it leads people to some dead ends and I quite like just the intellectual honesty of just saying well we're just going to affirm and assert you know it's, it's almost it's a choice right we here's the choice and in a, in a way morality is the choice to care about others and now let's work that out I quite like that approach mm. um, yeah let, let me say let me say a little bit yeah, more about this because, yeah. because it does you know I think there is a little bit more to it than just just asserting because it's not it's not an arbitrary assertion either right it doesn't mean it's groundless and you could have picked anything exactly exactly it's not yeah. it's not arbitrary and also simply asserting something or affirming something isn't enough to give it philosophical ethical political normative weight yeah. in my view so you know i i often think in terms of a metaphor actually of uh, or a uh, communal house, or we might think of like a town hall might be uh, an, an international uh, version of this metaphor. Um, you know, what is, what is ethics? What is politics? Uh, it is, to my mind, uh, something that we create uh, in which to live, in which we can live. And the reason I think of this in terms of the communal, <laughs> communal type building is because politics and ethics are uh, communal uh, social exercises. And so you have this house, right? And the purpose of the house isn't, uh, doesn't need to be any grander than it needs, it needs to help us to live in the world, you know, by providing shelter, by providing warmth, by providing a place where we can be together. Now, the landscape in which we build this house might be quite barren, uh, it might be quite unforgiving. Um, and you know what matters in terms of ethics and politics for me is this notion of coherence. What if we're just going to assert or affirm our ethics or politics? We need to um, give it as much uh, reinforcements as we can. But if we think about our ethics and politics as as a building, we can build it out of like straw, and it won't hold up. And to me, that's that's essentially what we do when we just say, "Oh, you know." Uh, we should be loving, we should be compassionate, we should be this, that, or whatever. Uh, what the challenge, I think, is to ensure that our ethics and politics has uh, philosophical strength and weight. And I think we do that with tools like reason and critical thinking, which, which can make this house coherent and you know, ensure that what we're building it out of and the ways in which we are um, putting the various pieces together um, ensure that it has strength so that it won't just blow over. It will it will be strong and it will last throughout time uh, and shelter more than just ourselves. Yeah, I think that notion of 
coherence, you know, just to give some examples of the way in which, uh, you know, just to take this out of the abstract uh, image into, uh, an exa into examples of the implications of this for ideas, uh, you know, talking about sentience, our, our ethics, our politics will be less coherent, less robust, uh, less able to withstand scrutiny and criticism if uh, we only recognize that human beings are sentient, you know, uh, it weakens that ethics and politics that we're building for ourselves if there is this obvious gap when we can actually look at a cat or a pig and say they quite obviously are sentient too. Uh, yeah. Similarly, um, you know, our, uh, you know, a lot of my thinking has been informed by black theory, indigenous theory, feminist theory, uh, and, you know, uh, I'm persuaded by the idea that our, uh, our anti-racism is undermined if we're not also anti-sexist, you know. So, you know, we recognize these similarities in oppression and, uh, you know, realize that we can't uh, unpick one without uh, unpicking the others. You know, that is an exercise in generating coherence for our morality or our, our politics, yeah. uh, you know, mm -hmm. ensuring that it has internal consistency and that, and the the implication of that is that we don't actually need our um, ethics and our politics to be standing on some sort of ultimate reality. Uh, it just needs to be uh, coherent enough and strong enough and robust enough for us to live in. Uh, and part of that uh, being robust enough for us to live in also means being sufficiently honest about uh, the rest of nature so non-human nature yeah. and uh the status and relationship that we have with that if that makes any, any sense no i love it i love it it's, it's fascinating because like you said you you can you can sort of move away from the claims for complete objectivity and that sort of rock solid foundation um without abandoning it completely and going to some sort of you know, arbitrary ethics or a nihilistic ethics or even a relativistic one that just says it was whatever we happen to agree in our particular context. You can still, you know, use reason and evidence and and those other structures to build a certain coherence that gives that structure. So it isn't just a wishy washy, you know, love everybody. It's actually got some, you know, coherence and in, internal integrity to it as well. I, I really like that. And you, and you clearly link to the second part of this question, which is who gets to matter? Because I think many people would like that analogy of you know us building a town hall that we're in together and there's a sense of collaboration and compassion and even love but there's an obvious question of you know who do we let into the town hall who's inside um and i'd be interested in your journey on that front too as you've thought about this the scope of ethics and politics um again you can wind the clock back into childhood if you if you you know want to go back into that sort of psychoanalysis but how did your thinking evolve about who warrants love who warrants cap compassion and i'm particularly interested in your journey for thinking beyond the human because in most of our cultures um you know that in itself is quite a radical step um, yeah so have, have you gone through that process of sort of thinking about moral scope the inclusion of non-human sentient beings yeah yeah absolutely and i won't i won't go all the way back to childhood partly because <laughs> i have i've written, written about this in other contexts but uh you know i just what I will talk about is in relation to the development of the politics of love. And mm. when I first when I first wrote about the politics of love, it was with uh, a dear friend of mine called Max Harris, and we wrote uh, a piece that actually ended up being published on his blog, and is the first piece that's collected in my book. And there's very little mention of non-human animals in that. And this was in 2015. And since then, my my heart has opened or reopened to uh, non-human animals and and the rest of nature. And it really has been a progression in stages and, you know, the recognition that non-human animals are sentient like us has been uh, fundamental to that, but it has been a stepping stone and I find myself moving increasingly beyond the concept of sentience and mm. uh, towards a broader recognition, which you alluded to earlier, uh, of 
the inherent value of um, of the more than human world broadly construed. Uh, so yes, there there definitely has been a has been a progression and has been an opening up, and and you can sort of trace it, or I can trace it. I don't think anybody else cares that much, but I can trace it. And when I look at these uh, these articles that I've written and, and interviews that I've had and so on, you know, uh, this uh, for me it's one of the most interesting parts looking back over the work I've done on the politics of love because that's one of the things that's changed the most. And yeah, thinking about how we show love and to whom we show love, I don't think that. Uh, that concept of the of the whareinui, of the communal house uh, really does justice to uh, our relationships beyond the human. Uh, so you know that metaphor has a time and a place for thinking for explaining a particular dimension yeah. of this of this politics. Um, but yeah, uh, an answer, to answer that broader question, who matters? I think you know the answer is everyone. And everything, you know, that's the that's the short answer. But we can explore yeah. that explore that more if you like. Yeah, yeah. And and um, I guess the way I've tried to frame this sentientism idea is it, it obviously focuses on sentience and granting moral consideration to every sentient being. Um, but it's it's sort of open minded about value beyond that. Personally, I'm quite strict with my sentientism in that I ultimately think that all value really comes ultimately back to the experiences of sentient beings but that doesn't mean i don't see value beyond sentience and beyond sentient beings too but i do think that the value in you know non-sentient living things the biosphere and the ecosystems for example and the earth as gaia i, I see enormous powerful value there but it feels to me more instrumental it, you know the reason i care about those things for example as opposed to a non-living geographical system in a on a planet on a in a distant galaxy with no life on it the reason i care about our ecosystem so much is because of its impact its critical impacts and interdependencies with all the sentient beings here as well but other sentientists are you know have a softer boundary than that they absolutely grant moral consideration to all sentient beings which is the core test if you like but they do see some degree of in intrinsic value that goes beyond that too um, and I'm quite open-minded about that, as long as the sentient beings don't get excluded. Um, and that's part of my frustration, I guess, with many people who look towards a more biocentric or ecocentric worldview. And you'd, I'd argue this is where the modern environmental movement is, by and large, is that it's purporting to have this sort of super generous ethical scope. We now care about the entire planet and the entire ecosystems and habitats and species and systems, but still conveniently excludes many trillions, billions, quintillions of sentient wild animals and absolutely all of the billions and trillions of sentient farmed animals from practical moral consideration. So it seems a, a sort of convenient veneer often on an anthropocentric worldview rather than a genuine extension of compassion to a broader remit. So I don't know how, your thoughts on that sort of criticism of some biocentric or ecocentric stances. Yeah, yeah, I share that. I think there's a lot of I think we'll find a lot of agreement in our thinking. I I agree that sentience is important and that it uh, needs to be taken into account, morally speaking. Uh, and sometimes I find myself in conversations like this talking about what I disagree with, but I do just want to state that I do agree with that. Um, but, uh, but the reason that I push beyond sentience a little bit is because uh, for, some, for some of the reasons that you've kind of already mentioned, uh, I think that it does lead us to, uh, or, is, or there is the risk that it leads us to construe the non-human world in instrumental terms. And I think, I think even when we're thinking about uh, recognizing non-human animals as sentient, I think they're, uh, you know, this notion of sentience is tethered to the human, right? It's, you know, something that we uh, recognize in ourselves, and then because we recognize it in ourselves, we extend it to uh, non-human others. Uh, and there are limitations in that. When I, this is one of the things that I've noticed in my writing, because it was, you know, the notion of sentience, the recognition of sentience that really uh, reopen, <laughs> reopen my heart and my mind to 
non-human animals. But, you know, when I write about, what, when I try to explain my writing very briefly about why we should care about non-human animals, I will now always deliberately talk about more than just sentience. I'll talk, for example, about interests, relationships, amongst other things, uh, because I think there is, you know, the value that we should recognize in non-human animals is uh, a value that inheres in them independently of their similarity or dissimilarity to us as humans. And I think when we recognize, when we make that leap and we recognize that, then it's not too much of a leap to also recognize that those dimensions of the non-human world that are lacking in sentience but also have uh, but nonetheless have uh, interests relationships etc you know are also uh, worthy of consideration in themselves you know the concept of sentience doesn't give us to my mind uh, it doesn't give us much reason that much non-instrumental reason for caring about a river <laughs> you know or a forest or the atmosphere or the planet itself, you know, all of that is, con is construed instrumentally when our sentience becomes the focus of our ethics or what we derive our ethics from, just as, you know, uh, you know the same thing happens when we uh, are thinking about uh, any other ways in which we are similar to, uh, dim to different dimensions of the non-human world. So I, so I see sentience as very important and as something that needs to be taken into moral account. But I see it as, in my, in my intellectual journey, I've seen it as a, as a stepping stone, <laughs> looking back, a stepping stone to a broader understanding of, of uh, you know, away from, away from a, an anthropocentric <laughs> uh, worldview. Yeah, thank you. And I, I think there's some really important points there and some serious risks because us humans are really good at coming up with some new framework and then strangely enough drawing it all back to being about us <laughs> and there, and there is a danger that sentience is thought of in that context because in a sense it's a it's a solid starting point you know i'm experiencing things now you might say that's the one thing i'm most sure of so you know it makes sense in a, in a way for me to start there and then to infer from engaging with you that you're probably sentient as well. You have a perspective and my moral decision is therefore to care about that. And then we can play that out through the rest of the sentient animal kingdom as well. But I think you're right that we've made a mistake if we think of sentience as being how like us are you? Because we know what that type of how like us are you ethic can lead to. So I try to correct that and try and re-emphasize on the fact that while we might be starting from our own experience as just a solid inferential starting point it's hard to completely avoid your own perspective um you know everything is filtered through that uh sentience predated not just me but all of humanity by probably you know depending on which scientific theory you prefer five to six hundred million years it's been around for a lot longer than humanity has um and it exists enormously broadly through the animal kingdom, at least. Um, so not only are we newcomers to this idea of sentience, we are also a vanishingly tiny percentage of all of the sentient beings on our planet. So I like to try and I still do focus quite strongly on sentience, and I'll explain why in a moment. But I like to try and make sure it is something that is helping us break the anthropocentrism. It isn't just a new version of using sentience as a you know a humanist like measure that we use to grant moral consideration i think that's a serious risk and it's an important thing to point out but i guess i would still see it as central because ultimately even in a worldview where we have moral consideration for plants for example or other uh, non-sentient biology or rocks rivers trees and forests there is still to me a fundamental moral difference between you know cutting the throat of a pig and cutting a plant because one is experiencing what is going on it has a perspective on that thing happening whereas another it might have interest in the sense that a plant reaches towards the sun but i don't think the plant is experiencing those interests being thwarted so that's that's partly why i see a dis distinction because i think of morality ultimately is about being a concern for the perspectives of others 
And I don't think that non-sentient things actually have a perspective at all. I think they can be deeply, richly important in all sorts of ways. But ultimately, I don't think they can be, they can't, they can't experience suffering in their own right. So they can't be morally harmed, even if they could be damaged. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It does. But there's I'm risks. Not, I'm, I'm no. not sure I agree, but yeah, 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 yeah. I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. And I think, again, we can, we can still find a space and I, this is one of the things I'm trying to do with sentientism is keep it super pluralistic and broad. So in, in a sense, you know, I'm quite comfortable. If people want to go beyond sentient beings in terms of their moral consideration, that's fine. I'm much more concerned about the exclusion of sentient beings than I am about the inclusion of non-sentient beings. That's, to me, that seems to be the core ethical risk. As soon as you're, ethic, as soon as you're excluded from moral consideration, anything goes right. You can be harmed with impunity. You can be farmed. You can be exploited. You can be oppressed in any way because you literally do not count as an ethical entity whatsoever. So that's my primary concern is to make sure that, you know, any being that can suffer gets included, but yeah, we can, we can still be generous beyond that. So no, that's been, that's been fascinating to explore. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I agree with your, with your concern that the environmental, environmental movement broadly concerned as uh, broadly construed has sort of overlooked, uh, the sentience of non-human animals, and that, that's problematic. Um, it's got to the point where people will advocate mass culling of obviously sentient beings to protect aspects of the environment that cannot suffer at all. Um, and I'm not suggesting there aren't sometimes really difficult decisions that have to be made in an environmental context, but it seems uh, often the sentient beings aren't even included in the calculus. Mm, um, mm. So people, you know, are more willing to grant rights to rivers than they are to farmed animals. And to me, that seems mm -hmm. strange. I, I prefer to grant yes. rights to both. <laughs> That's fine with me. Well, but, but yeah. 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 And I, I guess my response to that would be, yeah, why can't we, why can't we have both? Or why can't we think about yes. these, these things together? And it's one point of disagreement, I think, and that you know, in my thinking and yours around what you've said in relation to sentience is that you know I'm not. I guess I'm not convinced that value comes from sentience. I agree that mm. uh, the capacity for sentience should bear very strongly on how how uh, those aspects of the non-human world are treated. Yeah. Um, but I'm not convinced that, you know, I think that seems to me like a different claim to the claim that, uh, you know, one's value comes from one's sentience. Yeah. Um, so, yes, uh, slitting the throat of a pig is a different sort of harm and more and more of a harm in, in all sorts of ways to, um, you know, chopping down a tree. But I don't think that that means that the pig is necessarily more value more valuable than the tree or um if the pig is i don't think it's be, i don't think it's just because of i don't think that value derives from or is concentrated in its sentience and yeah i i, yeah. I feel like that's an important distinction and you know if i was if i you know we, we're using your examples here with the pig and the tree and and if i was to if i was to start from scratch using examples i would use um, probably you know my natural go-to instead of a tree would be a river or, or something like that um, mm. something broader or that comprises more that obviously comprises more relationships but yeah, yeah. I, I, don't, and, I haven't thought, thought about it enough. no that's it and, yeah. and i think many people who call themselves sentiences would agree with you rather than me as well because i'm quite sort of i don't know why but i i'm i'm quite strict in drawing these things back to sentience, but many other sentientists who grant moral consideration to all sentient beings would be more on your side of the fence and would be more, you know, open and generous. And I think you would also, you know, I would care about the tree and the river too, but whereas I would care about the tree and the river um, because of, again, this seems almost sort of too technocratic and strange because it even breaks my intuition, right? Because the reason I care about the tree and the river is, because of their impact on all of the sentient beings, the fish that swim, the birds in the trees, but even the aesthetic pleasure I and other humans and other beings will get from being around it, from the, uh, the interaction of the ecosystem services that uh, allow us all to enjoy and live in and be sustained by this 
environment we collectively all share. So I'd, I'd see all of those things as important. Whereas I think you would see them, even if you strip all of that stuff out, you, you forget the relations and the interdependencies and, and you say that, okay, there's no sentient beings involved here at all. There's just a tree and a river. You'd still see some intrinsic value there. Um, and I, I guess I'm a little bit more strict, but I think in practical terms, given the interdependencies, given the relations, given the rich webs and networks between non-sentient beings and sentient beings, I think in practical terms, we probably, there's some, still some coherence there, even if, you know, the value I accord is a bit more instrumental and yours is more intrinsic, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm, yeah. Just, I'm just thinking that, I'm just thinking that, um, you know, value obviously also ties to perception and, and who's, who's perceiving that value yeah. and what that perception looks like. And, you know, you might argue that that perception uh, connects to sentience. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure that yeah. I would. But and I think I, that's, yeah. and, and that's <laughs> and I think, a no, philosophical hold. Exactly. There. And I think, I think that's part of, the, part of the challenge. I think of sentience as such a broad concept as well. I think of it as any any experience, any experience whatsoever. So it's not just pleasure and pain, but it can also be a, a feeling of love, a feeling of attachment, a feeling of loss, a sense of existential angst, a sense of you know aesthetic pleasures and displeasures. You know, it's so rich and so broad. So that when I come back to you know, yes, relations are important, but relations are important because they're important to sentient beings and our experiences of our lives. You know, the interdependencies are important because of ecosystem services and sustenance and flourishing and connection. And so. I, I, I still see the value in all of those different things, but they still seem to draw ultimately back to, and those things are important because of their impact on the experiences of sentient beings. But, uh, but no, but that's been that's been fascinating to explore. I think there's some coherence, but like you say, there's some there's some differences to my, at least to my slightly strict approach to a sort of sentiocentric stance too. But that's been fascinating to explore. So um, let's let's move on to this. So we've answered what's real, what matters, and who gets to matter. I guess the final question to draw it all together is, and again, your work on the politics of love will play right into this, which is how can we make a better future? Um, so for some guests, this is thinking about some sort of you know, possible utopian future we might be able to achieve together um, as we come together in this town hall. Um, for some people, it's more about the pragmatic of pragmatics of change and how can we drive things forward often in this strange context where i think many humans in theory would sort of agree with some of the things we've talked about today but in practical terms social norms and psychology seem to block humans from being rational or compassionate or expressing love in, in a universal way so in that sort of frustrating context of humans having so much power but having so many blockers to our thinking how do you think about change in that context. And, and I'd also be quite interested in one, you know, a global context, how do you think about this thing, these things more broadly, but I'm also interested in how you think about uh, positive change happening within different cultures around the world as well. And, and it will be interesting to explore how, I guess, Maori ways of thinking intersect with thoughts about how positive change might happen, how human ethics might evolve, how our the ethics of our interactions with non-human animals might evolve. So, again, I should ask a crisp question instead of no, I'm, I'm. How to make a better future is the big, the big question. I'm really enjoying this conversation, and I feel like some some things that I don't often talk about, but that I have wanted to talk about, have been drawn out uh, because of it. So, thank you. Uh, so, in terms of how we might create a better world, I mean that is that is the project. Uh, that I've taken on and, and uh, sketching and, and now developing the politics of love, um, which, as I've said, is this vision of, of politics. And yeah, I choose to be deliberately optimistic in my writing and my thinking and, and often uh, against what seems like my better judgment sometimes. Uh, but, you know, what can you do? Yeah, I guess maybe I'll just say a little bit about the politics of love. So. Uh, I understand politics, as I uh, briefly mentioned, very, very broadly. So uh, I barely distinguish between ethics and politics. I think politics is thoroughly ethical. I understand it as a dimension of ethics. Uh, so uh, ethics concerns 
right and wrong and politics concerns that dimension of right and wrong, which uh, bears on our uh, social interactions, which is almost all of our all of our actions. Um, and the politics of love holds that love can uh, and should underpin and inform our entire politics. So the way that we uh, relate to each other one on one when we're having a conversation like this, uh, from this sort of thing uh, through everything else to uh, you know the sorts of policies that get made uh, by governments uh, and so on. And yeah, I understand love as a a way of relating. It's a, an orientation towards the world. So uh, it's something that we uh, consciously and deliberately adopt. And you know, one thing that one misconception that I think a lot of people start with when they hear me talking about love or when uh, they read my writing on love is that they think I must mean something emotional. Um, and, you know, this evening I've, I've heard you talking in terms of love, in terms of its emotional dimension as well, but I understand love as being uh, intellectual and emotional and uh, following bell hooks, especially involving work. So bell hooks, uh, yeah. African-American thinker who has you know, been hugely influential on, on my thinking in relation to love and politics, uh, basically understood work as being central to love yeah it's action uh, it's a uh, yeah yeah exactly exactly love as a verb uh yeah and so the politics of love as a as an intellectual project and you know a, a practical project is is an attempt to uh, imagine a better world uh for all of us um human and non-human uh, and you know, sentient and non-sentient. And before we and before we come on to ha how you're going to make that project happen, because I find that stuff fascinating. How we can go from the conceptual into practice, if you like. One pushback I'm sure you've heard is people will say, "Look, isn't love too demanding?" Right? Because I guess in my work, thinking about sentientism it has, I think, much in common with that project. Because we, but most of the time, I guess I'm. I'm sort of desperate to get some basic, even moral consideration. And if I'm feeling really generous, some degree of compassion. And it feels like love is asking even more than that. Do you, do you think of it that way? Is it a higher degree of ask or you know, do you think it, asking people to love everybody and everything is, is unrealistic? Is it too much? Should we start uh, or lower? I... <laughs> <laughs> well, Potentially, I mean, I guess it depends on what what we mean by love, and yeah, I can I can understand the the perspective that uh, asking us to love. Everyone I can imagine someone saying, "Look, can't, can't we get people? Can't we just ask people to give a shit at least first, and then?" <laughs> I guess I guess I start from a I guess I start from a, an idealistic or yeah, optimistic yeah. perspective, and, and like one that, that, like that one that one that sort of asks what do we need rather than uh you know what can we reasonably expect yeah. of people you know what do we need we need a loving world we need yeah. people to care and to care deeply about uh not only uh, not not only others because ourselves as well not just ourselves but um everything beyond us and my answer to that criticism would be that anything short of love isn't going to be enough isn't going to work you know the planet is in crisis our uh, treatment of non-human animals is absolutely atrocious and our treatment of other other people isn't especially yeah. uh, other humans isn't especially great and more than that all of these things are interconnected in so many ways and so love is what we need and yeah it is a lot to ask but <laughs> yeah. like that's what we need yeah. to ask of ourselves at the yeah. same time though i don't i don't see you know, some people seem to think of love as being this grand, this grand impossible ideal. You know, you might have love, true love for one person in your whole life, maybe two if you're lucky. And I just, I don't see love uh, like that at all. And I, yeah. I think at a personal personal level, I, I think I'm quite, quite quick to love. And, uh, and I think that is the understanding of love that, that I'm working into this vision of politics is one in which, uh, you know, love is not scarce and it's uh it's not limited and it's something we can uh have more of simply by uh choosing it yeah 
Thank you. Yeah. So let's come back to that. I rudely interrupted you, but you were just about to talk about okay how how we might be able to make this happen. Is it is it a question of getting billions of people to read your book and 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 switch? Do you see politics of love parties popping up in parliaments around the world, or what? You know how how do you think we can move from concept to praxis and um, mm. real change? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question and you know in my writing i have suggested some examples of loving action and loving loving policies i mean just to name a couple uh veganism at you know being adopted and at, at an individual level on a, on a very wide scale as an example of loving politics i think yeah uh, and you know decarceration uh you know all sorts of examples in terms of how we realize it i think there needs to be both individual and collective action uh, around, you know, individual and, and collective political action. Um, and that fundamentally comes down to people, individual people caring and choosing to uh, adopt a loving orientation in their lives. Because uh, as important as collective action is to achieving change, collective action ultimately always boils down to individual action in my eyes. So, uh, you know, we cannot affect any change unless we have that change in ourselves. Um, yeah, I mean, ev every, ind every institution comprises individuals, ultimately. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, we all have you know, diff different levels of power and influence and different roles we might be able to play as consumers and voters and leaders and employees and petition writers and voters or, you know, whatever. But but ultimately, uh, you know, I, I think the collective is a, a useful frame of analysis to think about. But I agree, ultimately, there's still the individual decision makers in their tens, thousands, hundreds, millions that are driving those institutional changes too. Mm. Mm. And yeah, I, so I think, you know, something that I often come up against in, in uh, criticisms of the politics of love or criticisms of this way of thinking is, oh, you know, individual change isn't, isn't enough, isn't powerful enough to um, shift the world. And my answer to that is that we need individual and collective action working together and that ultimately we're not going to get collective action unless we also have individual action and those individual commitments that we have will structure in many different ways are uh, the sort of pressure that we bring to bear collectively so in terms of how we bring this about i mean that's you know loving a loving world and, and loving politics i mean that's a very big question but something that, that i will say is that in this kind of answers part of part of a question that you raised earlier is that it's going to look different in different places yeah. so uh you know the politics of love realized here in Aotearoa, New Zealand is going to look very different to the politics of love realized uh, in the UK, where you're based at the moment. Uh, and that's because of uh, the different uh, histories and knowledges and understandings that we, uh, that we bring to it. And something that I want to be very clear about, but maybe I haven't been clear enough about uh, in my writing so far, is that this is a, a, a pluralistic vision in the sense that uh, it isn't, well, I have been very clear to, to say that I'm not offering a blueprint or uh, some sort of plan <laughs> for an ideal society. You know, this is something that should uh, arise uh, organically uh, within different societies and it should take on diverse uh, manifestations in those different societies. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I and and I I like the way you put that because I've been exploring some similar things as I've been thinking about sentientism because on the one hand there's a there's a real hesitation about anything that is universal because universal ways of thinking can feel in themselves oppressive they can feel like they crush difference and that they standardize and um and often they're driven by particular groups of people with power and you know pushed across others so there's there's a rightful I think a, a right r r rightful hesitation about universal approaches but i think the danger is if you abandon universalism completely i think you've lost your ethical moorings 
So I think as I think it's fine to have a, some universal principles and universal stances as long as they are really basic and foundational. And then beyond that, you leave enormous rich space for pluralism. Um, so as I've been thinking about those foundations being a sort of naturalistic epistemology and a you know at least a sentiocentric compassion, that still leaves leaves so much space for people to fight and argue and disagree about the different types of evidence and different conclusions of their reasoning and different ethical systems you might apply and and different cultures and different um, flavors of belief that might flow through that. And I, I guess there's something similar in your work with the politics of love, because you are laying out some, you know, universal tenets, you're talking about the imperative of love, you're talking about the imperative of, of you know, the non human being included as the human. But those are such basic foundational platforms. <laughs> oh, hello, another sentient being joins us. Yes. I can hear our canine family member who's just arrived at the back as well. Um, but, 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 but it still leaves an enormous space for that pluralism on, on top. Absolutely. And, you know, I have written about the politics of love as a space, and I describe it as a, as a, a round space with love at its centre within which uh, we come without, we gather with our diverse knowledges and histories and understandings in order to debate and deliberate and determine what our uh, loving politics actually looks like. And, this, uh, and, I, and I am very quick to say that this isn't a free-for-all. You know, there are, uh, as much as this space allows for diversity, there, there are some uh, limits to it. And I mm. sort of define those in terms of things like anti-racism, anti-sexism, anti-speciesism, and so on. Yeah. What, I, what, I, what I describe tentatively, and I no doubt will change this way of describing it as, a, as an intersectional commitment. And I also say that uh, politics of love as a space has uh, commitments to certain principles like uh, moral equality, um, philosophical honesty, and so on, uh, mut uh, mutuality, and, yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. on. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, that allowing space and diversity and uh, yeah, yeah, and I think it's really important from a, you know, from the point of view of humility too, because uh, I don't think we're ever going to realise the perfect society. And I think attempts yeah. attempts at that have been disastrous. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. You There's know, a danger in utopian to, visions, isn't there? Yeah. Exactly, and we're not going to realise a perfect understanding of love either. And I think it's really important to be very clear right from the outset that, you know, we can have a society that is not perfect, but that is more loving, you know, and it's, it's you know, trying to uh, create uh, communities that are more loving and that are as loving as they can be without uh, letting that notion of uh, perfection uh, undermine <laughs> yeah. the whole project. Um, yeah. And you know that's another that's another and it connects to the criticism that you were raising before. You know that we uh, humans aren't good enough, or that or that love is too much for us. Um, you know we don't have to be perfectly loving, and you know perfect love or a perfectly loving society isn't our goal. You know we can we can celebrate love and embrace love as individuals and collectives, even recognizing that we aren't perfectly loving. Uh, and I think there's I think that's where the I mean. That's a, a a loving approach to doing things too. I think you know, accepting ourselves and accepting each other in spite of the fact that we are uh, imperfect or you know don't live up to the, to the ideals that we sometimes try to impose on ourselves or others. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So there's 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 clear foundational stances, if you like, in terms of ethics and love and compassion and resistance to oppression. Um, but there's a, you know, a humility and an openness and a pluralism beyond that. I, yeah, I love that approach. One, one final thing I wanted to explore with you a little bit is um, often I see traditional and indigenous ways of thinking and worldviews being used to resist even those types of ideas about politics of love. So whether it's pushing back on um, anti-speciesism, or whether it's using traditional or religious belief systems that maybe um, you know do butt up against some of the principles you've laid out in the politics of love. Um, now, some of those responses, are, I think, are in bad faith. You know, you'll see that on the sort of vegan Twitter 
uh, challenges where people will sometimes even weaponize other people's indigenous beliefs to resist us having compassion for non-human animals. So some I think are just in bad faith, but sometimes there is almost a, a more positive stance where people are saying, look, we need to respect different ways of thinking, different ways of belief. These traditions, these cultures have very different ways of uh, operating. We can see the horror of colonialization and you know, people sort of crushing them and standardizing them, pushing them. Um, shouldn't we allow space for those ways of thinking to actually break what you've laid out in the politics of love. You know, if there are exclusionary ethics or there are ways of exploiting animals, for example, or if there are, um, for example, strict gender differences enforced through practices, shouldn't we in some deferential way allow space for that? How do you navigate those challenges when, when, when you're tr trying to put forward a politics of love that while pluralistic, it still has some quite strong ethical stances that butt up against, you know, many ways of thinking around the world, I guess. Mm. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a uh, really good question. And it's something that I grapple with. And yeah, it's interesting that, that, that this hasn't come into our, into our conversation yet. So as I mentioned at the start of the, at the start of this conversation, uh, I have uh, a whakapapa Māori, so Māori ancestry, and that cultural heritage the cultural heritage that comes with that has, has really shaped my thinking and so when I think about uh, the issues that you have raised in your question I think about this uh, specifically in relation to te ao Māori the Māori world and I think of it from within uh, rather than from without uh, and oh there's so much to say but one one thing that's uh, really important to say uh, right away is that uh, the Maori world has been and, and Māori, the Maori and Maori world views and understandings and and values and concepts have been really fundamental to shaping uh, the politics of love and continue to be in all sorts of ways. Another thing that I would say is that I don't personally I don't believe that indigenous cultures and I can only really speak for my own uh, should. should uh, be engaged with uncritically. And, you know, I say that uh, as an insider speaking about my own, speaking in yeah. relation to my own, my own, um, my own indigenous culture. And, you know, I've, I sometimes describe myself as which um, is a, is a kupu or which is a, like a, uh, a metaphor and it literally means the fish who tears the net, and it's used to describe a troublemaker, somebody who, yeah. who goes against the grain and who rocks the boat. And it usually has negative connotations, but I sort of owned this uh, owned this, <laughs> this metaphor as, as a description of me as a as a vegan who, and, you know, animal rights advocate who uh, happens to be Maori and who challenges uh, the Maori world from within. Uh, you know, and I like this particularly vegan image because, you know, it's the fish that tears the net to get away and yeah. tearing the net frees all the other fish. Um, and so I think, you know, there is, it's important that uh, these, you know, traditions, traditional ideas and concepts and worldviews are critically interrogated and that needs to be done with love. And it's, you know, important that that, happens from within, which isn't to say that it can't happen from without, but um, it's harder to do it with love when it's coming from without, I think. And I love that approach that, to my mind, being willing to criticise our own cultures and, and with love others is a mark of respect. Um, I would 100% agree. Um, and and yeah. whereas, whereas an unquestioning deference to me can seem quite patronising. And, and there's also often this sense that People have this view of, you know, and of course there's a dizzying variety of radically different indigenous cultures, that they are sort of perfectly preserved in some sort of historical aspect and will never and should never change. Which again seems odd to me because every single culture is evolving and developing and changing and has the capacity for critical self-reflection and ethical improvement within it. So yeah, so I've, yeah, no, I found that a very yeah, yeah. encouraging start. I completely agree. Absolutely, and that 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 idea that that indigenous cultures are 
preserved <laughs> and should be preserved and are relics of the past is patronizing and it's a it's a colonial idea yeah yeah but at the same time we also need to recognize that uh and again i i, I talk in relation to uh the maori world which is what i have some small amount of authority to to talk in relation to you know that we have to recognize that um a, lo a lot of the efforts that have been uh made to change us have come from without and they've been not uh for us or with us, but you know, done to us, and yeah. there's a lot of harm in that. And so that's why I say it's important for change to come from within, and um, yeah, and for those criticisms to come from within. But I, I 100% agree with that suggestion that uh, you know, when we uh, criticise and uh, critique, we are being respectful. I think that you know that uh, that's a sign of of love. You know, I, I. In my writing, I don't engage with with ideas that I don't respect, you know, unless those ideas are so harmful that they that they demand to be responded to. If I am if I am disagreeing with somebody or um, you know quoting somebody who I disagree with, it's more often than not because I recognise something in there that uh, deserves respect. So yeah, yeah, thank you. And I think it's Jennifer Nash who. Um, who makes a similar point about loving loving critics and yeah um, i can't remember the name of the book something about uh, yeah i can't i can't remember i have to look it up yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'll look it up i'll look it up well it's it's been an absolutely fascinating inspiring conversation sorry for keeping you so late is there anything else you'd like to layer into the conversation before we wrap up i don't think i don't think so i just want to say that i really appreciate this conversation because as i've said we talked about some things that I don't often uh, get an opportunity to talk about and, and uh, yeah, really appreciate that and appreciate it hearing your your perspective too. And it's given me some some things to think about, which I will continue to think about after uh, this conversation ends. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Likewise, I've learned so much. But I think we've done well. We've answered what's real, what and who matters and how to make a better world in 90 minutes. So it's not bad going. And I look forward yes. to a world guided <laughs> by your politics of love it's inspirational work so what's the best pe way for people to follow you read your work by the politics of love book yeah so the, so i'll send you i'll send you some links but the book is called love uh, love notes for a politics of love and it's published in new york by lantern and that's a good place to start if you want to uh, think a little bit more about the politics of love i'm also on facebook and twitter reluctantly increasingly reluctantly might even remove myself eventually, but I have a website <laughs> as well, philip-mckibben.com. Um, but I'll, I'll send you those links because, you know, people misspell both of my names. So <laughs> Yeah, that's great. I'll include, them, I'll include them in the notes so people can uh, look through. And I hope you stick with us on Twitter. We need, we need uh, compassionate voices. So <laughs> let's see. <laughs> yes. Great. Well, thank you so much. I will let you get to sleep. Um, it's been a real pleasure. And thanks for spending so much time with me, Philip. Well, thank you. Take care.